Well, we're back in 1 Thessalonians. We've finished chapter 2. Today we're going to begin chapter 3. We're just marching right along. It's really my hope and my prayer that the Holy Spirit has been encouraging and convicting and just strengthening you as we've been going through 1 Thessalonians. I, I know that the Lord's been working on my life as I've been studying this book, as I've been presenting it to you guys, and so I've really enjoyed 1 Thessalonians so far, and I pray that the same is true with you. You know, I've uh, had the chance over the last couple of weeks and months to catch up with several friends of mine who are also in ministry, and like such meetings go, we, we talk about what we're preaching through, what we're teaching through, and when I tell them that we're in First Thessalonians and have every intention to finish and then go on to Second Thessalonians, the same question always comes up. You know you're going to get into some eschatology there, right? And that's when I have to exercise a lot of self-control. No, I had no idea. <laughs> but that same question comes up. And it's, it's true that in both Paul's letters to the Thessalonians, here in 1 Thessalonians and again in 2 Thessalonians, there are a lot of teachings of things that he tells them that surround the events of Christ's return, right? That's what we mean by eschatology, the end times, learning about things of the eschaton, the end, right? But it would be a mistake to think that eschatology is the primary purpose and focus of his letters to the first and second Thessalonians. We've spent seven weeks in first Thessalonians thus far, and then we've certainly seen references to the end times, right? Back in chapter 1, verse 10, we have read that the wrath of the Lord is indeed coming. In chapter 2, verse 16, that his wrath is as good as already upon those Jewish apostate leaders that ran the team out of Thessalonica and Berea. In chapter 2, verse 19, we read that the joy of Paul, the joy of his team, is the knowledge and the understanding that those Thessalonians are going to be in the presence of the Lord at his return, at his coming. So there's a lot of references to the end, but that hasn't been the driving force of the letter, has it? Overall, the tenor of this letter is that of comfort, that of encouragement. The focus is to build up these battered believers and encourage them in their, their fight, their perseverance in the face of real persecution. We've learned much more about really the practical side of ministry than anything else. And before I continue, I just want to highlight that word practical. That doesn't mean that there are some elements that are just unimportant or more important than others. What I mean by practical is what goes on day to day. What has Paul been doing day by day by day in his time in Thessalonica? And that's what we've learned greatly going through chapters 1 and 2, particularly chapters 2. We've read, we've studied, we've examined, really, what Paul did in Thessalonica. And we've seen how God has blessed his efforts there. Now, it's not like Christ's second advent was absent from Paul's mind. Quite the opposite, really. It's Paul's knowledge of these events that are assumed in almost every paragraph of this letter. We've made a point in saying that the Christian hope, which has appeared several times already, the Christian hope is entirely eschatological. It is that focus and that understanding and the certain knowledge that Christ will return and will return victorious that is the foundation of the Christian's hope. So eschatology, the understanding of the end times, the events surrounding Christ's return are shot through this entire letter. It's a part of it. Frankly, it's a big part of it. But even more important in the mind of Paul is the foundation, the foundation of the faith of the ministry here in Thessalonica. He's writing primarily to encourage and to ensure that the Thessalonian church is firmly grounded in the truth. 
That's really the reason that he defended his ministry's experience there, the time that the the team was spending in Thessalonica, that defense in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, that was the whole reason for it. There is no room for error here. But Paul also cares deeply and passionately for God's word, but also for God's people. And we began to see that at the end of chapter 2 in verses 17 through 20. Paul began to reveal his own heart for the people there in Thessalonica, if you remember. He revealed his desire to be with them. He revealed that his joy is the Thessalonians themselves, the joy that they bring them. That was kind of an x-ray view into Paul's heart. And that x-ray view is going to continue right into chapter 3. So I hope you're there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to read and we're going to study the first five verses of chapter 3. So read along with me. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer afflictions, and so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you, and our labor be in vain." Just like last week, we read in these words a lot of emotion. Really, this is directly linked back to the section that we covered last week. You see that word, therefore. Perhaps you've heard the old joke, but whenever you're reading through the scriptures, you come across a therefore, what do you have to ask yourselves? What is it there for? Right. It's pointing directly back to verses 17 through 20. Because we desire to be with you, because you are our glory and our joy, when we could endure it no longer, we took action. Now, if we just want to follow what Paul tells that he did, following Paul's actions, we see him doing three things in these verses in chapter 3. He's left alone in verse 1. He sent Timothy in verses 2 through 4, and there's a lot in there. And then he sought news in verse 5. But as we study what Paul actually did, and we seek to understand what's actually going on in Paul's mind and in his relationship to the Thessalonian church, I want to draw out some implications. The focus today is going to be very similar to last week in that we're getting a look inside a pastor's heart. And guess what? Next week we're going to pick off right where we leave off today. I don't know about you, but I'm extremely interested in understanding Paul's heart and understanding his thought process here. And it's not simply that he's the most influential human being that has ever walked the face of the earth. And think about that, he is. Every single believer today, in some way, owes his spiritual lineage to the Apostle Paul. He wrote 13 books of the New Testament, for pity's sakes. He's planted more churches, seen more personal converts than anyone in the history of mankind. As far as a mortal man, there is not a single more influential person that's ever existed But really, that's not why I'm so interested in understanding Paul's heart. I'm interested in understanding these words because this account is inspired by Almighty God. Paul moved Paul, or God, let me start over. God moved Paul. Paul to write these words to the Thessalonian church in a very real historical context, but when Paul was writing this, Almighty God knew that we would be covering these verses today. Let that sink in for a second. I'm interested in understanding what Paul has to say because 
God not only inspired but preserved these words, knowing we would study it today so that we might learn it, we might understand it, but then we might do likewise. So I'm very interested in understanding fully what Paul is meaning here in this context so that we might learn and do likewise. And so as we follow Paul's actions, I want to draw out four implications. We're going to take note of four characteristics of a pastor's heart for his people. But here's the thing. You can simply exchange that word pastor for Christian. We're going to learn four characteristics of a pastor's heart, but when we apply this, we're going to look at four characteristics of a Christian's heart for God's people, if that makes sense. The first characteristic I want to look at is that a pastor or a Christian is marked with a selfless attitude. Look at verse 1 again. Therefore, when we can endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And like we said, that therefore points right back to what we covered last week. And really, in light of Paul's and the team's desire to be with the Thessalonians, in light of their being their glory and joy, we could endure it no longer. That word endure, some of your versions might say when we could bear it no longer. It means to, to hold back, even conceal. This word is used of a container's ability to hold water, right? If it endures, if it bears it up, nothing's leaking. In a more emotional context, like what we're talking about here, if we wanted to use kind of modern vernacular, this is a poker face. The ability to conceal emotions or thoughts. You just kind of put that up and you don't reveal anything. That word endure and bear. But the team is so overcome with their desire to be with the Thessalonians that they could not hold it back any longer. They could not endure it any longer. Some of your versions might say that when we couldn't stand it, there's not just a little bit of anxiety here. I'm sure that we've all had to wait for important news. The birth of a baby maybe a decision after a job interview, results from a medical test. The most difficult thing is to sit and wait for the phone to ring. We just want to pick it up and call ourselves, right? Because even the worst news beats the waiting, beats the not knowing. Really, more or less, that's what Paul's doing here. But he didn't place the call himself. Rather, the team collectively decided to send Timothy while Paul was left in Athens alone. Now, if we're familiar with the account in Acts that covers the planting of the Thessalonian church and then the subsequent being run out of town, there's a few questions that might pop up here, and I just want to address those briefly. Back in Acts 17, I thought Paul was already alone in Athens. Didn't he leave Silas and Timothy in Berea? And frankly, these verses don't speak of Silas at all. Where is he anyway? By the time we get to Acts 18, Timothy and Silas join Paul in Corinth, not in Athens. So how do we kind of marry this up? Well, Luke didn't record all of the details, but as we're putting the pieces together from what we know in Acts, what we know here in 1 Thessalonians, and what we know Paul has written to the Corinthians while he was there, we can kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together like this. We know that Paul was ran out, well, the whole team was ran out of Thessalonica, and they landed in Berea, just about 10 miles south of there. But eventually, Paul was forced to leave there as well, leaving Timothy and Silas in Berea. And Paul went on to Athens, but was shortly followed by Silas and Timothy. And it was there in Athens that the decision was made by the team to send both Silas and Timothy back to the churches of Macedonia. Silas to Philippi, Timothy to Thessalonica. 
And that leaves Paul in Athens alone. Well, that's all well and good, but how does this bring out our point of demonstrating a selfless attitude? Well, I'm going to give you three reasons for that. The decision to remain in Athens was not at all what Paul desired. That was much of our time last week, right? Paul's strong desire was to be with the Thessalonians, to see their face, to actually be in physical contact with them. The last thing he wanted was to be apart from them. But if Paul were to return now, it would only make matters worse. Remember, we spoke of that last week. He was putting aside his own desires, knowing what was better for the church there. And so as much as he wants to be there, he sends Timothy. And really, I think that just really shows that, again, his interest is for the Thessalonians. Why didn't he send Silas? Well, sending Silas back to Thessalonica is going to turn up the exact same kind of trouble as Paul. When we read through Acts 17, it's Paul and Silas that are identified as the ringleaders. Timothy somehow escaped their notice, could slip in under the radar without perturbing the mob. Paul had their interest, not his own, in heart. This was a selfless attitude. But secondly, no one desires to be left alone. Now, some of you might be saying, on contrary, I rather enjoy being left alone, undisturbed, unbothered. That's not what this word implies here. The word implies abandonment, neglect, being left behind. Now, Paul's not a rookie evangelist. He's not a rookie church planner, but he has always had a team with him. For the first time since he began his ministry, he is without human companionship. Ministry is hard enough work. I can't imagine doing that completely and utterly alone, devoid of human help. But Paul understood the situation. There's two brand new churches back in Macedonia that need encouragement, that need teaching, that need some leadership. And I can't be the one that goes there. I'm just going to round up the mob again. I've wore out my welcome. And so the team decides to divide and conquer. And once again, Paul's mind is not on himself for the good of the believers in Macedonia. The third reason that this really is a selfless attitude is because Athens was not a place welcome for ministry. Athens was full of hard-hearted, arrogant, worldly intellectuals. I don't know about you, but I would rather have a gospel conversation with a hard-hearted pagan than with a self-proclaimed intellectual. Have you ever been on a college campus? Have you ever shared the gospel on a college campus? I have, actually. I spent a few months going once a week on campus at uh, California State University at Northridge at CSUN. I would pass out tracts and try to evangelize, and I actually did a little bit of open-air preaching there as well. It is extremely discouraging, extremely discouraging experience being surrounded by people that are hopelessly lost and are convinced that they know precisely what's going on and that they have all the answers. That was Athens. This is the place where Paul was left alone. But he tells us this not to draw our pity He's revealing his heart. He had a selfless attitude. The second characteristic of a pastor, or we can even say a Christian, is that the Christian understands that stability comes from teaching. Teaching. 
Stability comes from teaching. Look at verse 2 and then the first half of verse 3. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. Remember that the main thrust of this letter is to encourage, it's to strengthen, it's really to propel the Thessalonians in a pursuit of Christ-likeness, of holiness. That's why Paul sent Timothy in the first place. Now, we've already discussed why Paul picked Timothy, but when he does so, he has to make certain that the Thessalonians know he's not on the JV squad. Look at how he refers to Timothy, our brother. He's one of us. He's our kinsman. He is equal in every way to Silas and myself, Paul is saying. He describes him as God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ. Now, this fellow worker does not imply that he is working together with God. God is the mover and shaker. Timothy is an employee of God. He works for God. He belongs to God. He is God's fellow worker. The fellow refers back to Paul and to Silas. He worked with us. We were engaged in the same task, in the same endeavor, in the same work. We had the same job preaching the gospel of Christ. You can trust this guy. He is one of us. He may have escaped the notice of the mobs, but that makes no indication that he's any less worthy, that he's somehow unable. He is more than qualified for the task at hand. But what is the task at hand? What specific purpose was was Timothy sent back to Thessalonica to do? To strengthen and to encourage you as to your faith. That's a loaded statement. We're going to break that up into bite-sized pieces. To strengthen. Really, it means precisely that. To fix firmly in place. To establish to support, to provide stability. I'm in the process right now of putting some shelving up in my garage. And I don't just put a board up there and slap some duct tape on it and hope that's going to hold, right? No, along every single stud, I'm putting up a brace. I'm putting up a support because I plan on putting a lot of weight on those shelves. There's going to be a lot of pressure on those shelves. Look at that word affliction. In verse 3, that's the same word translated as tribulations in chapter 1, verse 6. It means pressure, if you recall, to press, to squeeze without adequate support. The weight and pressure will cause collapse. Timothy came to support them, to strengthen them, to be that buttress, to lift the pressure. But he also came to encourage. Now, I want you to put your finger right there on the word encourage. And then I want you to find verse 11 in chapter 2 and look at that word encourage. Those are not the same words. If you remember from our time going through chapter 2, verse 11, we defined that word encourage, the idea of really a biblical view of encouragement is to speak to a situation as to what to do. It is solution-oriented. To encourage someone is not to come and pat them on the back and tell them everything's going to be okay. To encourage someone is to come alongside them and speak truth into their life as to what they need to do. This is the situation. This is the biblical answer on how to deal with it. That's encouragement. But that's not the word we have here in chapter 3, verse 2. I actually really like how the English Standard Version translated this verse. It reads, to establish and exhort you. This word actually is found 
in chapter 2, verse 11. But it's the same word translated exhorting there. Now, what does that mean to exhort? If you recall from our time going through chapter 2, you understand that exhort is a call to come alongside, a call to come here. Really, it's a call to toe the line. The idea is that you are not supposed to be here. You must be here. This is not the way it's done. It is done this way. A call to come alongside. A call to come here. Timothy came to strengthen, to stabilize, to exhort, to call the Thessalonians to come alongside. But look at the subject matter. As to your faith. Timothy's purpose for coming down to Thessalonica can be really boiled down to a single word. To teach. He came to teach. This is how our faith is strengthened. Tell me, is it helpful knowing that you have the spirit of the living God living within you? That you have been made alive in Christ? That for the first time in your existence, you actually possess the ability to obey him? Is that helpful? How do we know that? Because we read it here. Because someone has taught us from the scriptures. This is how faith is strengthened. Is it encouraging to know that God has elected you unto salvation? That you cannot lose your own salvation? That every soul that the Father has placed into the hand of Christ, he will not lose one? Is that encouraging? Is that strengthening? That's the way it works. The more we know about God and his word, the stronger our faith is, the more pressure we are able to take. You know, for a long time now, the church has noticed that most teens forsake the church as soon as they leave home. I've seen a lot of different percentages, but basically three out of four teens that are brought up in the church leave once they leave home, never to return. Why is that? It's because we've never taught them anything. Sure, they know that Jesus loves them. And this I know because the Bible tells them so. Sure, they know that they're supposed to obey their parents. But we've never told them why. Do they even know the need of repentance? Have we ever taught them that? Can they even articulate the gospel? Not just Jesus died on the cross to save me from my sins. That's not the gospel. That is only a part of it. Do they understand that they were born into this world shaking their fist in defiance at a holy God? Did we bother teaching them? Or did we just entertain them? Amuse them. And what gives me gall is that we then have the audacity to shake our heads and wonder what went wrong. Now, this isn't just indicative to the youth. The church needs teaching. The church needs strengthening and exhorting. It needs to be taught. Because life's going to bring pressure. We're going to be shaken. That's really the idea behind that word disturbed there in verse 3. So that not one of you would be disturbed by these afflictions. The word picture there is that of a dog wagging its tail. Shaken. Back and forth, back and forth. He doesn't want a single one of you to be shaken. If you wanted to put it in more modern terms, you know that machine when you go and buy a gallon of paint and you stick the paint in there and just, just shakes the bejeebers out of it, right? That's the idea. We need stability. We cannot exist in this environment. That comes through 
teaching. And so Paul sends Timothy, his own brother, his fellow worker, God's man, to teach them so that not one would fall under the pressures of affliction. Paul understands that stability, this strengthening, comes through teaching. A third characteristic is that a pastor or a Christian encourages with an eschatological perspective. Now that's a mouthful. With an eschatological perspective. Let's read the last part of verse 3 and verse 4 together. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this, that those afflictions. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer afflictions, and so it came to pass, as you know. Now, perhaps you're having trouble kind of connecting these verses with an eschatological perspective, a perspective of the end times. What do the end times have to do with the current sufferings of the Thessalonian church? Everything. Everything. Because when Christ returns, he will be a victor. Satan will be bound and righteousness will reign upon the earth. The existence of wickedness in this world is proof positive that Christ has not yet come. We haven't missed anything. Now, I hope that part's encouraging. But it also means that we have absolutely no reason to look for fulfillment in this current life. This is not our home yet. Our hope is not wrapped up in our own circumstances. We are indeed promised life. We are indeed promised glory and peace when he returns. We're not promised our best life now, but after he returns and reigns as king. And frankly, the only thing that we are guaranteed is trials, tribulations, and yes, eventual triumph. The gates of hell will not prevail against Christ's church, but folks, it's not for a lack of trying. I hate to break it to you, but suffering is part and parcel of being a Christian. That's not my, my words. That's actually what Christ himself taught. I want to read to you a couple of portions of Scripture. Matthew 16, 24. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples, and he says, If anyone wishes to come after me, to follow me, to be my disciple, to be a Christian, he must deny himself, take up his cross. That's not your little cross necklace, folks. That's an implement of execution. You're ready to die at a moment's notice and follow me. Mark chapter 13, verses 9 through 13, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he is telling them to be on guard for they will deliver you to the courts and you will be flogged in the synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings for my name's sake as testimony to them. The gospel must first be preached to all nations, and when they arrest you and hand you over, don't worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you that hour, for it is not you who is speaking, but it is the Holy Spirit. He goes on, brother will betray brother to death, and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Perhaps you remember what Christ said about Paul's own conversion in Acts chapter 9. The Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. 
This is what we are called to. Yes, there is glory and joy when the king returns. Right now, the only guarantee we have is suffering. This is not news to the Thessalonians. Did you notice how this section is bracketed? Our favorite little phrase, just as you know. Right at the beginning and right at the end of this very point. This it was a main teaching point of the team when they were in Thessalonica. They weren't taken by surprise. They knew precisely what they were getting into. So why is this not a main teaching point in churches today? Why don't people teach this? Repent and be saved so that you can suffer. You know, I'm reminded of, of a book. Ray Comfort's the author, which again is ironic. He's actually a good guy. And the title of the book is God Has a Wonderful Plan for Your Life. And on the cover is a picture of Stephen being stoned. There's a guy standing right over Stephen with a rock about ready to bash his brains in. God has a wonderful plan for your life. And it's true. He does have a wonderful plan for your life, but that involves suffering. Why don't people teach this? Well, frankly, because people don't want to hear it. It's really hard to fill coffers and fill seats when all you're offering is suffering. But some pills are hard to swallow, and most time those are the most necessary. Think of it this way. How many of you have suffered? It's okay, you can raise your hands. Imagine if that had caught you completely and utterly by surprise. That's one, just one reason why the prosperity nonsense is so dangerous. If my life is supposed to be hunky-dory because I'm a Christian and I'm not healthy, wealthy, and wise and I'm actually undergoing tribulations, then clearly there's something wrong with me. Or you're obedient and this is precisely what Christ promised you If our perspective is not future, if our hope is not in Christ's return and final glory, then folks, we have no hope. Because the present reality is depressing and it's going to get worse before it gets better. And so we must encourage and strengthen and exhort one another with an eschatological perspective, an eye on the end goal, not here and now. This is not our home yet. The king will return and make this place fit for his citizens and his reign. Just a sidebar. Before we continue, how does this affect our daily interaction with people? Every single person you come in contact with will indeed spend eternity either worshiping God in his glory or cursing his name under his wrath. If you're obedient to Christ, you will not be popular. The unbelieving world will indeed hate you. But if that's not your current experience, I think it's fair to ask, how obedient am I really? A lot of the time we escape persecution, not out of God's grace, but because there's nothing significant to persecute. Food for thought. 
our hearts must be focused with an eschatological perspective. Our fourth characteristic, a Christian knows that success is marked by perseverance. Success is marked by perseverance. Look at verse five. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labors be in vain. Paul's anxiety is clearly seen in this verse. If you've noticed, all of the we's have turned to I's. Paul couldn't stand it any longer. Paul couldn't endure it any longer. He's about to burst. He's been run out of town. He's been forced into exile. He has absolutely no idea what's going on back in Thessalonica, and so he sends Timothy. He sends Timothy to find out about their faith. Was it real? Was it genuine? Or had Satan, the tempter, snatched the word away from them? You know, I was reading this and studying it. I couldn't help but have Jesus' parable of the soils in the back of my mind. Had Satan snatched the gospel away from him, just like that hard-packed soil that the seed fell upon? They seemed to have received it with joy, but were they rocky soil? Was there root? Or perhaps the cares of this world were too many, and the gospel was choked out by weeds and thistles. Or were they good soil? Did the gospel take root? Were they growing? Were they going to produce fruit? Only time will tell. You know, I've heard a lot of texts get turned into a way to create a Christian witch hunt. How can I tell you guys are true believers? There's only one way. Perseverance. Do they persevere? Do they remain in the faith? Or do they fall away? Do they become an apostate? Do they neglect the assembly? Do they trample underfoot the blood of Christ? Only time will tell. But frankly, that's the problem. Because Paul didn't have a whole lot of time with them. After just a few months of preaching and trying to minister to them and trying to teach them, he was forced to leave, and now he's on pins and needles, wanting to know. He has no idea how they responded to the pressure of persecution. Because the temptation mentioned here has already come. That's really the, the nuance of this verb. It implies that an action has already been accomplished. The temptation had already come. Pressure had already been applied. The question is, what was the outcome? That's what Paul needs to know. Did they cave? Did they succumb? Did they fall away? was all the blood, sweat, and tears that we spent there in vain. Was it for nothing at all? Paul understands that this is a real possibility. That's why he sent Timothy. He sent them to teach them, to strengthen their faith, to call them to live in accordance with their faith, to toe the line. You know, it's really this idea that makes me realize that much of the church has a misinformed view of evangelism. 
If we could just get them in the doors, if they could just hear the gospel and make a decision for Christ, then their life's good to go, right? Conversion's not the end game. Conversion is only the beginning. We preach Christ and him crucified so that the lost might hear the gospel, repent and believe. But that is not the purpose, the main purpose of our weekly gathering here together. We gather and we open up the word of God and we teach it and we preach it so that the saints would be strengthened and encouraged and established and not be shaken. That's why this day is so important in our week. That's why this time is so precious. Because you're not going to last out there alone. You go maverick, you're going to get shot down. That's why this day is so precious to us. That's why Paul sent Timothy back to teach to shore up any sort of misunderstandings they might have had so that they might be able to withstand that pressure because the pressure had already come. But he also sent Timothy to send word. He needed to know how they were doing. Was their labor in vain? You see, Paul cared about the people he ministered to. That's the difference between being a preacher and being a pastor. He could have just said, I fulfilled the Great Commission. I went there. I spent time there. I preached the gospel there. Seemed like there was a decent response. Got too hot. We left. I'm out. Left it up for God, right? But he had a pastor's heart for his people. He needed to know how they were doing. Ministry has two objectives. We preach, we teach, and we proclaim God's word. We proclaim the truth. We do it dogmatically. We do it unapologetically. We do it boldly. But ministry is two people. That must be loved. People that must have concern for. And both of these truths must be maintained in tandem. We proclaim the truth because we desire people to grow in holiness, to grow in Christ likeness. It's not just about being right, it's not just about having the right message. We do what we do out of fear of our God, love for our Savior, and concern for His people. And really, that sums up Paul's heart. I pray that that sums up ours as well. Christians should be marked with a selfless attitude. We must understand that stability comes through the teaching and the learning and the knowing of the word of God. And we encourage encourage each other with the end game in view, with an eschatological perspective, God wins. And we know that success is marked with perseverance. I know we're closing on something of a cliffhanger here. But just read verse 6. Timothy returns with good news. As is our custom, at the beginning of every month, we are going to observe the Lord's Supper. You know, the Word of God only demands a few things from the gathered saints. We are not to forsake the gathering of the saints. Hebrews 10 tells us that. Once we gather, we preach and we teach the Word. In calling sinners to repent, we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And while gathered, we observe the Lord's Supper. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I know this is familiar to many of you, but we are going to read this, and I want to make just a few comments about it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23, Paul is writing and says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26 is extremely important for our understanding. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Finish it. Until he comes. All of the feasts and the sacrifices of the Old Testament are pointing forward in anticipation, in hope of what God would do to redeem his people. We're kind of in between. This supper points backwards at what Christ has done. And we celebrate in thanks and in gratitude. But it also points forward because we know that he will return and reign in righteousness. This is not designed to be a time of some sanctimonious navel gazing. This is not about us. This is about what our God has done and what he will yet do.